When men are not governed by God, they will be ruled by tyrants. Copying is not theft. Stealing a thing leaves one less left. Copying it makes one thing more. That's what copying's for. For charity. Slowly and surely, they drew their plans against us. The last war began in error. Whose error nobody knows. Nor does it matter anymore. Nothing matters now other than survival. You wiped out all semblance of rhyme and reason. Cities obliterated, farmlands devastated, the ecology imbalanced. And all that is left is a parched and arid wasteland, a scorched and seething earth, where what little water there is, is hoarded and kept under heavy guard. This councillor is a Freemason. To charity. But he doesn't always tell the public when he votes. Neither does this councillor. We don't like to talk about it. Do we need a register of Freemasons to force them to be more open? If there's nothing to hide, why give the impression that you've got something to hide? <laughs> Join the Masons. But the government still wants judges, magistrates and policemen to declare their membership. <laughs> The Home Affairs Committee is pressing for a compulsory register. For charity. And would like to see it extended to local government. <laughs> the main area of concern is the planning process. I had this case of a officer in the council stopping me and saying he had been approached by Councillor X, who said to talk to him and in the course of the conversation said well if you want to put in effect progress your career you should come over there boys which was to where the masonic lodge was for charity nobody knows how many planners have joined a masonic lodge because membership is private we don't like to talk about it i can only wish you all the best in the future <laughs> That's different, sir. You can start on Monday. Join the Masons. This secrecy can lead to surprises. Councillor Jim Hardman was chairman of West Dorset's planning committee for charity until he died last year. I went along the Bray Respects to a, a man that I thought a lot of. And I sat in the pew in this village church and I sat right behind the coffin and then it hit me, really, smack in front of me, was the symbols of Freemasonry, the dividers and the compass. And that was the first intimation I had as a group leader on West Dorset that Jim was a Freemason. We don't like to talk about it. The rules of local government do not force Masonic councillors to declare their membership. Join the Masons for charity. But they do have to declare an interest if a mason from their lodge submits a planning application. The councillor should, should, should declare the interest. He doesn't have to say what it is, but he needs to declare it. And he then needs to absent himself from any decision-making process involving it. He needs to keep away from it. He needs not to go to the meeting where it's being discussed. He shouldn't lobby about it behind the scenes or speak to an officer or other members about it. He should just leave it all alone and keep away from it. Southern Eye looked at whether councillors in Dorset are following these rules. We identified 16 councillors with Masonic connections. And 13 of them are involved in planning. For charity. One of the longest serving is back on the Masonic Isle of Portland. Are you aware that sort of under the local government code of conduct you're supposed to declare an interest if somebody in your lodge submits a planning application? I wasn't aware of that, no. But uh, as far as I know, I'd never been involved with any member of any lodge. 
We found an example where a fellow lodge member had submitted an application. There's no suggestion that Mr. Ames tried to influence the committee, but he did not declare an interest. We don't like to talk about it. For charity. Mr. Ames has temporarily resigned from the Freemasons, and he's not sure whether he was still a member at the time of the committee meeting. <laughs> we don't like to talk about it. I think I probably wasn't. But as I say, um, I take applications in the planning on the evidence I've got, and if I'm not happy with it, I go to look at it myself and form my own opinion. <laughs> For charity. There is also one Masonic councillor on the Northern Area Planning Committee in West Dorset. Terry Farmer joined Sherborne Lodge in the same year as Owen Curtis. Mr Curtis has since submitted a planning application to Mr Farmer's committee, and so have two other members of Sherborne Lodge. There's no suggestion Mr Farmer improperly influenced the decisions. Nudge, nudge! But he never declared his interest. Know what I mean? Know what I mean? Nudge, nudge, know what I mean? Say no more. We don't like to talk about it. For charity. There have been these three cases where Freemasons in your lodge have submitted planning applications. Nudge, nudge. Why have you not declared an interest? Well, none of them have been my personal friends. I'm a member of a, the Conservative Party here. There are about 500 members in Sherburne. Some of them I know very, very closely and are what I would call my personal friends. If they came up, I would then declare an interest in the same way if a Freemason that was a personal friend of mine, I would do so. Say no more, say no more, now what I mean, nudge, nudge. All the lodge members don't go to the lodge. I mean, some people like myself are not that frequent in attendance due to the fact that they've taken on other duties in public life. For charity. I don't think in practice you could actually really keep this to the rules. The Ombudsman cannot comment on individual cases. Nudge, nudge. We don't like to talk about it. But he says it's vital that councillors do keep to the rules. This is, after all, a secret society. It, it works on uh, secret signs, secret codes of language, uh, meetings are held behind closed doors, and many people are suspicious that Masons are there to further uh, the ends of other Masons. For charity. Well, that's a suspicion that really can't be allowed to, to um, visit local government. Amongst the most controversial in the planning system. For example, uh, the very recent 500 dwellings in the Oxford Greenbelt, which were allowed. Nudge, nudge. A Mother Teresa Mungusley large amount of great work <laughs> for charity. But uh, we don't like to talk about it. On the 3rd of July 2017, South Oxfordshire and Vale of Whitehorse District Councils appointed Mark Stone as their acting chief executive, but who remains in place. For charity. John Howell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would my right honourable friend agree that the probity of the planning system has been enhanced by the decision of the Secretary of State to proceed with the South Oxfordshire District Council's local plan? Nudge, nudge. And that the holding of an examination in public online is a very good, transparent way of proceeding. For charity. Virtual proceedings are an effective way of ensuring that the light of public interest uh, shines upon planning decisions. And I think the decision that was made with respect to South Oxfordshire was the right one. Nudge, nudge. The biggest criminal fraud heist in British history. Carroll has connections with the great and the good, not just royalty, but senior politicians. He had 85 companies, a string of racehorses, and collections of art and cars. Yet within years, his empire was reduced to this, a few pictures and mementos of his former wealthy life. Now the serious fraud office is studying hundreds of documents which Carroll believes proves his business collapsed because of systematic fraud, not, as some argue, the recession. A nod's as good as a wink to a blind bat. Know what I mean? But he has never declared an interest. Councillors who don't declare interests may also be breaking the rules of Freemasonry. We don't like to talk about it. Nudge, nudge. As every Freemason promises to abide by a strict moral code. For charity. In May 2020, during the flu propaganda outbreak, 
South Oxfordshire District Council, gave its head of planning, Adrian Duffield, the power to make decisions due to what it called the challenges presented by the pandemic. <laughs> For charity. Stefan Gerizyak, one of Henry on Thames, three representatives on the council, protested, saying that parishes would lose their democratic right to comment on planning issues in their areas. Nudge, nudge. However, Councillor Gay Ryziak failed to mention that his local parish councils falsely display an independent opinion as a sideshow to the fact that they are one of the same umbrella corporation, Oxfordshire Council Conflicted Interests, Fraud. In December 2020, Henley councillor Stefan Garizyak was criticised for opposing plans by his next-door neighbour for an extension, when his partner was doing the same for their home. Garizyak urged colleagues on the Henley Town Council's planning committee to vote against his neighbour's proposal for a single-storey rear extension at her house next door to him. He then declared an interest and withdrew from the Zoom call when his partner's application was being considered. After the meeting, he declined to comment. We don't like to talk about it. For charity. We should be worrying about the findings made by anti-corruption organisation Transparency International, who found many local authorities lack the necessary safeguards to prevent corruption in our planning system. See Permission Accomplished 2020, PDF in description, shows us why because of corruption we should be sleeping with one eye open. Discretion is arguably at the heart of our planning system. This creates inherent risks within the framework designed to provide democratic oversight to the development of our built environment. Not one of the responses to the planning for the future consultation made available to date, nor the select committee, have focused on the need for planning reform to combat corruption. The definition of corruption according to Transparency International is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Corruption can come in many forms. It can be in the form of political donations to local branches of a political party around the same time as a planning application. Or it could be payments for the tuition fees of local councillors' children, holidays, multiple business contracts, cash envelopes, brotherhood lifetime favours, etc., forming a cartel, of left-right, county and regional controlled opposition. For charity. Nudge, nudge. Um, the Secretary of State will not have the public confidence he needs to overhaul the planning system. The public needs reassurance that the integrity of the planning, planning process cannot be auctioned off at Conservative Party fundraising dinners. For charity. This government is committed to maintaining public confidence in the probity of the planning process at all levels. Yeah. Guidance published by MHCLG on planning propriety which focuses on the duty to behave fairly and to approach matters before them with an open mind. Nudge, nudge. For charity. Can I ask the Minister, is it a coincidence that Mr Desmond made a substantial donation to the Conservative Party oh. just days after the Secretary of State rushed through permission for the West Ferry development against the advice of his own planning inspector and one day before Mr Desmond would have become liable for a £50 million tax bill? Did major Tory party donor Mr Desmond ask to sit next to the Secretary of State at the Conservative Party dinner yeah. on, the, on the table, uh, Mr Speaker, where, by a mere coincidence, according to accounts, were seated other developers involved in the scheme? Mr Desmond himself has admitted that they discussed the scheme over dinner, but the Secretary of State says they didn't. So I asked the Minister, who out of the two is misleading the British people? Very cursory about misleading. I'm sure no honourable member of this House would ever mislead anybody. <laughs> None of the department. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My right honourable friend has been absolutely clear. Uh, the applicant uh, raised the issue of West Ferry with him at that dinner. My right honourable friend made it absolutely clear that he could not discuss planning matters, that he would not discuss that planning matter and the issue was closed. Nudge, nudge. So to recap, we have a planning decision which is unlawful, which we've through guidance and tall buildings downplayed the heritage impact on the Greenwich World Heritage Site, increased the intensification of the housing units by 113% at the same time as reducing the proportion of affordable units by 40%, was taken on a time scale which exempted the developer from making contributions and which saw a substantial donation to Tory party coffers. Doesn't the Minister understand how bad this looks? Why isn't the Secretary of State coming to the House to explain why he sought to exercise his powers in the manner which he did?
and will he now ensure that all the documents and correspondence germane to this decision are released so that people can understand for themselves the nature of the apparent bias in this case? Given that the Prime Minister pushed through the original screen for the same developer when he was Mayor of London, did Number 10 have any involvement in events or conversations leading to the Secretary of State's unlawful decision to grant approval? I think with respect to the Honourable Lady, Mr Speaker, um, she is wrong. That was an entirely uh, different application. Nudge, nudge. But all in good nature. No violence, no bad feeling, just good fun. For charity. Amazing. The board would not have authorised me to reveal names without the men's permission. Public suspicion about Freemasonry led to a parliamentary inquiry. I'm You're telling I'm us to mind our own business, aren't you? No, what I'm saying is that I and, and Freemasons generally resent what seems to be a fishing expedition when we are delighted, delighted, yes, delighted to help. The specific inquiry. No, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. it, is that is that yes or no? Well, I, do the lodges know the occupations of their members? Yes or no, please. Do they have a record? No. Do they know them? Possibly yes. It's not they, a simple. No, thing. no. Excuse me. This is this is exactly what I want to get at. Are you? They were very very reluctant to have anything to do with us, and uh, they seemed to think that they could pick and choose whether or not to answer the questions. Well, I mean, in a sense, they could. Uh, but as we had to point out at one uh, rather tough session, uh, there could be consequences for them declining to answer the questions which we had asked them. If, you know, if someone would give me a specific allegation against the names... The, the answer is no, isn't it? That you're not willing to allow the committee to, to assess this information? The answer is yes, with a caveat. I, I'm saying that your records, either at provincial or national level, are sufficiently adequate to enable you to answer the questions we put to you, or most of them, if you choose to? Uh, with, with a caveat. It, it used to be your position that you would cooperate with Parliament. Has that now changed? No, I'm, I'm cooperating as Do far as I can. Do you understand that if we now issue a formal order for the information, a refusal to cooperate may amount to contempt of Parliament? I've answered that one, yes. Yes, you do understand that. We are the ones who will decide what the questions are. And you, the decision for you is whether you're going to answer the questions we put to you to the best of your ability. Now, the, there's two possibilities there. One is yes and one is no. But, but we're reaching make your mind up time. There are ways and ways of answering questions and they, I believe you me, they answer them with a minimal <laughs> content. <laughs> I think I should probably have to go back to the board and ask them because what I'm, I've, I've come here is with a very clear idea that if I have specific allegations and the leave of the men, then the names can be given. Now, I've got the leave of the men on condition that sp the specific allegations are made. And that is yes. It's a yes but, but it's yes. I'm willing to help. I'm not saying no. Well, but you're not willing to provide the names on not, the basis of not, the answer. Not straight do. out. No, I'm no, not. So the answer is no, isn't it? It must be considered. No. Well, I hope, you, no. I hope you can accept it as being no, but not in a contemptuous way. For charity. Well, that will be for Parliament to decide. Thank you very much. The committee concluded that Freemasonry was not the primary cause of the problems. <laughs> Freemasons are also keen to promote their charity work. Here we are. We don't like to talk about it. All done and dusted again. Nationally, they raise £15 million a year for good causes. One of Dorset's biggest charity events was a Pirates' Day out for disabled children on Round Island. That was a wonderful day. It's one that uh, will always live with us. It's, it started just from uh, an embryo idea from some of our members that with some of their work in the community dealing with uh, disadvantaged um, children that we ought to be uh, doing something special for them for charity I always remember the looks on on their faces they, they had a wonderful time know what I mean I'd like to introduce our host and hostess here today <laughs> Harry Palmer and his delightful wife Ina now they're the ones who have hosted the event today on this delightful island without their kindness this day wouldn't be possible. The owner who allowed the children to use the island that day was a Freemason called Harry Palmer. For all of your help and all of your kindness and thank you for helping to make this day such a, such a wonderful success. Mr Palmer is a developer who has built hundreds of homes in Dorset. And nods as good as a week to a blind bat. For charity. We don't like to talk about it. Know what I mean? 
Some of his company's planning applications go through East Dorset District Council, where they're considered by councillor Derek Burt. <laughs> Mr Burt's been on the planning committee since 1966, and for the past 20 years he's been in the same Masonic lodge as Harry Palmer. <laughs> For charity. We don't like to talk about it. Mr Burt is one of only three Masons on the committee, and there's no suggestion he improperly influenced decisions. But Southern Eye has discovered that he does not always declare his Masonic interest. Know what I mean? We don't like to talk about it. The amended plans for this Harry Palmer development in Corf Mullen were opposed by the pensioner next door. You wait until they get the tiles on. It isn't going to look quite so good once the tiles on. She told oh, sure, Mr Burt's yeah. committee that the executive homes would overlook her small bungalow. I thought they listened. I thought they were sympathetic. Um, but when it's all over, you suddenly realise that um, you didn't get what you wanted. The What's builders got what they wanted. It doesn't look yeah, like it's it It's not did. a lane any longer. I'm going to put all the blinds around the wrong way. At the meeting she attended, yeah, Derek Burt never mentioned his relationship with Harry Palmer. We don't like to talk about it. Oh, no. No. No, and it isn't something you even think about. Mr Burt says he only declares an interest if the planning application is contentious, and he points out that he did so on one Harry Palmer development. <laughs> But over the past decade, Mr Burt has considered 13 Harry Palmer applications. And at 12 of these meetings, he did not declare an interest. We don't like to talk about it. Trust and confidence in the system is absolutely fundamental. And members of the public must be assured that councillors are always considering whether they have a financial or non-financial interest in something coming before them, and if they do, they must keep out of the decision-making process. For charity. Fire and Sons are building in many of the nearby villages. Some of these sites had outline permission when the company bought them. But Fry's still submit numerous planning applications. For charity. Mr Rowe has considered 27 of these since joining the planning committee three years ago. With public engagement at an all-time low in the planning process due to meetings now being held online or not being held at all, what advice is the Minister giving to planning authorities <laughs> to maximise public probity uh, to prevent any decision being steamrolled through? Um, planning is essentially a local matter. The vast majority of local planning decisions are made locally. Sometimes they are appealed to the planning inspector, but only in a small number of occasions uh, will those um, uh, applications come to a Secretary of State. I'm very keen keen to make sure that the planning system in our country is swift, is transparent and reflects and adheres to uh, local needs and I shall make sure that my honourable friend, his comments, his concerns are properly reflected in all our considerations with respect to planning processes. Charlotte Nichols. Thank you Mr Speaker. Campaigners in Warrington North have been battling to save Peel Hall from development for over three decades. With planning law already weighted so heavily in favour of development, what assurances can the Minister give that the developer cannot simply make a substantial donation to the Conservative Party to subvert the process and that residents will get the fair hearing that they deserve and can have confidence in that process. Mr Speaker, the planning law in this country is very clear as the Honourable Lady knows. I, suspect she, I suggest that she goes and reads it. Freemasons say their secrets are harmless. Worshipful Master, an alarm and that revealing them would spoil the experience for new members. Whom have you there? Mr John Smith, a poor candidate in a state of darkness, who has been well and worthily recommended, regularly proposed and approved an open lodge, and who now comes of his own free will and accord, properly prepared, humbly soliciting to be admitted into the mysteries and privileges of Freemasonry. Although we're not a secret society, um, we do consider the internal workings of our lodges private 
Um, but that's not because anything that goes on in the lodges or anything that we would be anyway ashamed of. Are you therefore willing to take a solemn oath founded on the principles I have stated to keep inviolate the secrets and mysteries of the order? I am. I am. We teach the member stage by stage to have a greater self-awareness, knowledge of oneself and the various characteristics that we feel are most important for, uh, for all citizens. Then you will kneel on your left knee particularly charity, benevolence, uh, fidelity, and generally speaking, to be a good and upright citizen. Give me your right hand. And that is better communicated, we feel, in the old ways of teaching, and that is two-part plays, where the individual member participates in the whole of the role play from beginning to end. That is the way the old stonemasons used to do it in the very old days, and we just propagated that down through the generations to today. The ceremonies may be hidden from view, but Freemasonry is slowly moving towards a more open policy. <laughs> this museum in Poole can now be enjoyed by the general public. The history of Freemasonry in Dorset goes back 264 years, and there are artefacts from many of the province's 48 lodges on display. The old Masonic aprons on the wall tell their own stories. You'll see they contain three figures, faith, hope and charity. And these are symbols that we concern ourselves with in our ceremonies and in our general moral standards. We need to maintain public confidence in the probity of planning process in this judicial role in these matters. The all-male tradition still survives. The links between stonemasonry and freemasonry can be seen in quarrying areas. On Portland, there are six Masonic lodges and 500 members. Nationally, about one in 70 men are Freemasons. On Portland, it's one in eight. I was apprenticed in October 29, 1929, and I served a five-year apprenticeship. And then I did progress from stonemason to foreman and assistant manager and eventually works manager. When I was apprentice, we were trained to lift the mallet and brush the lobe of your ear. I don't do that now. The mallet, of course, is of heavy wood and falls very heavily upon the head of this tool. Now, in Freemasonry, the chisel points out the advantages of education, by which means alone we are rendered fit and proper persons of an organized society. And the mallet should keep down all vain and unbecoming thoughts. There are a number of symbolic tools that are used as part of our ceremonies. The square teaches morality. It teaches us to harmonize our conduct in this life so as to render us acceptable to our God. The level demonstrates equality, demonstrates that we are all sprung from the same stock. Because the time will come, and the wisest of us know not when, when all distinctions, save goodness and virtue, would cease. And death, the grand leveler of all human greatness, would reduce us all to the same state. The plum rule represents uprightness. It teaches us never to turn to the left or the right from the paths of virtue. Freemasonry is full of strange language and rituals, but some of the ceremony has increased public suspicion. My hand given to a master mason shall be a sure pledge of brotherhood. My feet shall travel through dangers and difficulties to unite with his in forming a column of mutual defence and support. These vows suggest that like the old stonemasons, Freemasons still believe in mutual support. So do they also protect and promote their own members? Some people believe that Freemasons enter Freemasonry to sort of get on in their careers. Is that not the case? I think probably that um, it's true to say that one or two may well do that. But in reality, once they're joined, they soon learn the principles of Freemasonry. For charity. All in good nature. 
but he has never declared an interest. I think it's down to us in Freemasonry to educate people, but at the same time to challenge them and say, well, why single out Freemasonry? Where is the evidence to do that? <laughs> We gathered that uh, a little item we did last week about Freemasons may have caused that organization a certain amount of irritation. Yes, <laughs> irritation. And we'd like to apologize for this because, believe me, we never intended to insult this, this fine body of men, the Masons. No, uh, chaps who just meet together. Uh, raise money for charity. Uh, wear aprons. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, I, I wear an apron at home myself sometimes, too. Mm. Me, too. Um, not a... not a goatskin one, my dear, but, uh, but an apron, yes. Slowly and surely, they drew their plans against us. I see dead people. While you're awake? Dead people like in graves and coffins? Walking around like regular people. They don't see each other. They only see what they want to see. They don't know they're dead. How often do you see them? Slowly and surely, they drew their plans against us. Few men even considered the possibility of life. As someone with a microscope studies creatures that swore multiplying drops. Few men even considered the possibility of life. For charity. <laughs> <laughs>